We're in a series right now, though, called Family Tree. So if you have a Bible, turn to 2 Kings 22. That's where we're going to be, 2 Kings 22. What we're discovering in this series is that everybody has a family tree. Everybody has a mom, everybody has a dad, some of us have siblings. And for all of us in our family tree, there are stories that are great stories, stories we're proud of, goodness. And then there's also stories that, that hurt, gaps. I was thinking about my family story, Wes, and uh, my grandma would always say, a Middleton, my last name is Middleton, a Middleton was on the Mayflower. Now, I don't know if grandma was crazy or there was a Middleton on the Mayflower, but I just believed her, huh? And then she'd say, hey, Arthur Middleton signed the Declaration of Independence. That's a family member of ours. Again, I don't know if it's true, but it sounds awesome. And then most recently, my cousin Kate Middleton got married to Prince William. I wasn't invited, but, you know, I'm still angry. But, okay, that one's not true at all. Uh, but then there's stories in my family that uh, I, I'm not so proud of, you know, stories of, of alcoholism and stories of abuse. I don't like to share those stories. Can we go back to Kate Middleton? You know, I don't want to. I want to tell those stories, but all of us have those stories of goodness and gaps. When you're reading the Bible, what you'll see all throughout the Bible is there's genealogies. There's, there's these records of family trees. And here's my temptation. Do you have this temptation too? Here's what I do. Can I skip over this to get to the good stuff? But what you actually find when you read those genealogies is there are actually lots of good stuff, stories of massive victory, but then there's also lots of terrible things, stories of massive failure. And actually, when you open up the Bible, the Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the New Testament, you open up, you're like, this is the story of God, this is the story of Jesus, where are they going to start? You know what it starts with? A genealogy, a family tree. And when you open that up, you discover Jesus has a family tree, and his family tree is a lot like yours, not so perfect. <laughs> it's not so perfect. There's stuff in there like, he did what? Who? With who? You know, Really? And there's stories in parentheses, and there's fascinating stories. And Jesus, the, the perfect son of a perfect God, has a not-so-perfect family tree. Hmm. And yet God begins to use his, his family tree just like he's going to use yours, just like he's going to use all of ours to bring grace, God's grace, to our lives. And so what we see in this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 10. We're going to look at Josiah. Josiah. And this is what it says in Matthew chap, chapter 1, verse 10. It says, Hezekiah had Manasseh. Manasseh had Ammon. Ammon had Josiah. Josiah had Jehoiachin, say that five times fast, and his brothers, and then the people were taken into the Babylonian exile. So who's Josiah? That's who we're going to study. 2 Kings 22. Let's look and find out who he is. This is what it says, Josiah, uh, 2 Kings 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. Let's just stop right there. Eight years old. What were you doing at eight? Josiah was king. I was just getting in trouble, Wes. Like, that's what I was doing at, at eight. And he's king. Some of you have children that are eight. Some of you have grandchildren that are eight. Could you imagine if tomorrow they became king? <laughs> That'd be terrible. And have you, heard, have you ever heard the saying, who died and made you king? Have you ever heard that? Well, Josiah would say, my dad. Ammon died. And Ammon was actually an evil king. He was only king for two years. And then his officials uh, didn't like him, and they assassinated him at 24 years old. And so Ammon dies, and what kind of king was Ammon? Well, first let's see what kind of king Josiah was. This is what kind of king Josiah was. It says this in verse 2. Josiah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. He was a good king. But his father, if you go back a chapter, let's go to chapter 21. Uh, 2 Kings 21, verse 19, this is what it says about Ammon. It says, he was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for two years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. Did you catch a connection there? So Manasseh did what was evil. Ammon did what was evil. But Josiah decided, I'm going to change the story of my family. Every generation gets the choice to change the story of their family. Some of you are here, and that's you. That's what you're doing. You're deciding, I'm going to be like Josiah, and I'm going to change the story in my family. So a quick recap. Let's highlight the, the big moments in Josiah's life. At eight years old, he becomes king. Somewhere around 15 and 16, he starts seeking the Lord. At 26, he discovers the book of the law, the Bible. And then after that, he helps the people return back to God. And all of this West starts when he's eight years old. So uh, if you're taking notes today, our big idea, write this down. We believe 
We believe that kids can change the world. I wonder, like, why is this church so hyper-focused on investing into kids? Well, I would contend that that's what Moses told the people of God after the Ten Commandments. Let's start there. I'd also contend that Jesus said, lest you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That Jesus was always bringing kids forward to do what? To work not only in the lives of kids, but also to work in the hearts of adults. And I want you to hear this. Something happens in our hearts when we decide that we are gonna get involved with Jesus in raising up kids that are gonna change the world. Let me tell you about one of the kids of the church. Her name is Jada. Uh, Jada loves kayaks. And uh, Jada really wanted a kayak. She wanted a kayak, and so uh, she'd saved up for one. And you know how hard it can be for a kid to save up money, right? Right? Well, she'd been saving, and she just about had enough to buy a, a kayak. And then she came to a New Life gathering and saw that there were children in poverty who needed sponsors. Looking at those, she made a hard choice. One of the things you're going to find is this. Generosity will always bring you to a place where you have to choose something. And so she actually chose, she actually said to her parents, is it okay if I don't buy the kayak and use that money because it would be about one year of sponsorship for her child? Would it be okay if I did that? Okay, now, what Christian parent is going to say no? <laughs> and if you do, seriously, you, anyways, okay. <laughs> so the parents, the parents say, uh, okay, you can do it. So she sponsors a kid, gives up the kayak, and does it with joy. Her story of generosity has started to go out. And do you know what happened? Other New Lifers heard about this, and guess what? She didn't get a kayak. <laughs> she got two. And what you see is this, is God not only works in the hearts of kids to lead them in the area of generosity and to make a difference in the world and be arrows out and say, it's not about me. But when, a, when an adult sees a kid say, it's not about me, I think we're like, yeah, it's not about me either, right? Mm. Listen, all during this camp, okay, no kid is required, but every kid will be encouraged to actually bring an offering. And we do it guys against girls because that's how they do it in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of this, this is what we did. The kids, over the years, what the kids have done is the kids over our kids' camp years have raised the money to build schools in Burkina Faso for kids to have e opportunity for education. And it's the same places where we've been doing Walk for Water to bring clean water. Just found out this past week, one of those schools placed number one in the nation. A hundred percent pass rate. The average in Burkina Faso is 46%. They're like, how are they doing so well? Because they get food, they get water, they get health care, and they also get this, the gospel. Mm. This year, uh, last year, many new lifers were helping raise the money to do a medical center. This year, the kids' offerings are going to go to bring supplies to the medical center so when you come, they actually have stuff there to be able to care for kids that are sick or hurt. Don't you think that's an awesome thing for us to do as a, as a church? Woo! And this is kids learning it's not about me. Do you think kids are born saying it's not about me? My kids didn't. I didn't. No, but along the way, the gospel comes in and we start to learn it's not about me. This is how God raises up world changers. And we see this in Josiah's life. And so today we just want to look at Josiah and say, okay, well, how is it that God raises up a world changer like Josiah? And so the first thing, write this down, is this, that God has grace for what you have to face. God has grace for what you have to face. Some of you, you, you had this like... Great childhood experience. So, some of you, though, something happened. It might have been when you were eight that created some tragedy in your childhood. And you had to grow up really early. When I was eight or nine, my mom had cancer. Uh, that was a pivotal point in our family and in my life. Now, my mom lived. Josiah's dad didn't. And you can see their family seemed to be somewhat of a mess. I mean, in fact, actually, his grandfather, Manasseh, reigned in Israel 55 years, and it's recorded that he is the most wicked king that they ever had. This guy's whole lineage says this, you're going to probably be evil and wicked. But Josiah, he, at eight years old, he starts a trajectory that says it's not going to be about me, and he begins to make some shifts. And what he sees is this, is God begins to give him grace for the things that he has to face in life. Eight years old, doesn't even get a chance to grieve. What does he do? He has the responsibility of a nation. But you can see his heart starts to turn towards the Lord. I, I just believe this. Whatever it is that you had to go through in your childhood, God has grace for that. 
And now listen to me. Some of you are the victim of circumstances, but I wanna give you gospel good news. You don't have to stay a victim. The goal of every victim is not to be stuck as a victim, but actually to be set free. And that God has grace for you in that. Listen to me, here's what the cross does. The cross of Jesus Christ, because of his death and resurrection, because evil has been disarmed, because the power of God is greater than the power of evil. Here's what's happened. You can actually remember your childhood redemptively. You can look back through the lens of the cross with grace and see the people that even in your life that may have done ill towards you, and you can see them through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. God has designed us not to live in the past, but to remember the past, to live in the present, and to create a new future. Listen to me, when your source, when your, when your wounds, when your wounds cease to become a source of shame, they start to become a source of healing. God has grace for whatever it went through your childhood. We don't wanna raise a, a generation that feels like they're victims. We wanna raise a generation of kids that believe God's grace is greater than anything that I'd ever have to go through. Yeah. We're teaching kids that. The second thing that we learn is this. God makes moments for you to meet him. Write that down. God makes moments for you to meet with him. You know God wants to meet with you? God wants to meet with you. He desires to meet with you. And, and he doesn't just like, he doesn't give himself, he desires to meet with children. You know, he doesn't give himself to children in, in miniature pieces. God doesn't give himself to children as a mini Holy Spirit. He gives children the full real thing. And we want to have students, we want to have children that have the opportunity to have a moment with God. I love what it says in 2 Chronicles 34. This is another account of Josiah's life, 2 Chronicles 34. And, and this is what it says in verse 3. It says, during the eighth year of Josiah's reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the Lord of his ancestor, David. So somewhere around 15 or 16 years old, Josiah starts seeking after God. 15 and 16, he makes this decision. I am going to follow after the God of my ancestor, the God of David. You know, I get to thinking, like, you look around, and, and hopefully you got to see, like, all this stuff, all the design, everything. that. Why do we do kids camp this big? Like, like you know, we do summer camp, and summer camp, we're going to a resort in Idaho. Why do we bus kids all the way to Idaho for summer camp? And some of your parents are saying, because that's how far they need to go for me to get peace and quiet. <laughs> why do we do that? Here's why. Mauricio. Mauricio, last year, last summer, was not following Jesus at all. And grandma just started, really in the, in the past few years, started following Jesus. And grandma said, Mauricio, you're going to camp. And he said, no. But when grandma says you're going to camp, guess where you end up? Camp. You end up at camp. <laughs> so Mauricio's at camp, and it's Thursday night. And Mauricio has a moment where he meets God. He gives his life to Jesus Christ. He comes back from camp totally on fire, but his grandma who sent him to camp, the cancer came back. And then over the course of a few months, grandma passed away. Mauricio would call it his burning bush moment. And this is what his crazy idea is now. His crazy idea is he says, in my generation, I want to see the cure for cancer found. Don't tell me kids can't change the world. Don't tell me kids can't change the world because Mauricio's gonna change the world. And guess what, when he was 15 or 16, guess what, he had a moment with God. Listen, there's something that happens with you and many of you here are volunteers at Kids Camp. There's something that happens as an adult when you see children on fire for God. It like makes you young again. <laughs> Cocoon. Sorry, that was Wes a throwback. Wes is still rapping, so, you that know, this is great. He's, you know, I, I don't know why, <laughs> right? Why? It makes us young again. It makes us young, and it gives us life. It gives life to our church. You know that? It gives life to our... Why do we do youth gatherings all across the peninsula? Because we want teenagers seeking after the Lord, don't we? Yeah. Why do we do kids gatherings and kids ministry on Sundays and on Saturday nights, all, at our, all of our locations? Because we want children growing up with the presence of God in their life. L yesterday, my son is biking with the neighborhood kids and he face plants on his bike. 
and he hits his face, he starts bleeding, and, and my wife's like, please don't let his tooth die, you know, like, please. and he, he cries, he goes inside, and then we go outside, he's kind of having his moment, he comes out with a smile on his face, and he has like a red dot on his gums, and we're like laughing at him, you know, and he comes out with a smile on his face, and he looks at us, he said, I'm going to be okay, we, we said, why, why, he said, God told me he's going to heal my tooth. My son's four. He's four years old. God told me he's going to heal my tooth. I was like, I need, God needs to tell me stuff like that too. <laughs> you know what I'm so thankful for? I'm so thankful for Miss Jan and the teachers in early childhood who have been teaching my son to believe that God can heal no, him. That's cool. Right? Are we thankful for our teachers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, we, we want the gospel to win in families. We want the gospel to win in families. Some of the most profound moments with God are at camps or, or at kids' camp like this, but some of the most profound moments are in a minivan or on a hike or on a walk or in a living room or at a family meeting. My family, last year, I shared the story in my devotional that we've been doing uh, on Facebook. My dad called. I have five brothers, six boys. My dad called all of us said, hey, we're having a family meeting. And when dad calls, you don't miss that meeting. We showed up, and my dad looked at us, and he said, I'm sorry for what I did in the past. Will you forgive me? That was a powerful moment in our family. It started the healing process. Our, our process is still happening, just like it is in your family. But last Saturday night, my, my brother, my last brother, finally got married, and we celebrated. We were dancing, and um, you know how they have daddy-daughter dances at weddings? Well, my mom has six boys, so she said, I'm having a mother-son dance. <laughs> and my mom was dancing with her son, and at the end of the song, we surprised my mom, and all five, all six of her boys surrounded her, and we danced with her. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you, man, that's a powerful moment as our extended family looks and said, wow, that's a picture of the gospel, a family being healed. Listen, your loudest gospel message is going to be through your family. Some of you need to write that down. Your loudest gospel message is going to happen through your family. And some of you are here and you said, my kids are grown or my kids are far away or I don't have children. Perhaps God has placed you on this earth to raise children that are not your own, that are his children though, that he wants to raise up. And we want to be a church that makes moments, moments for people to meet with God. The third thing that we see in the life of Josiah is this, is that he begins to build his life on truth. So write this down. God gives you truth to build your life on. God gives you truth to build your life on. Okay, can we have an honest moment here for a second? I mean, the lights are down, so not everyone will see it. Who here has ever lost their Bible? Come on, you lost your Bible before, okay? All right, all right. Okay, now, how many of you, you didn't lose it, but you didn't misplace it? Okay, okay, (laughs) a lot more hands. I, 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 I had a moment one time where I could not find my Bible. And um, apparently, some of the kids in the youth group stole my Bible because they wanted to, like, uh, recover it and then put a bunch of notes on it just to say that they loved me and cared about me and were for me. It was a pretty cool moment. But like for a week, I was walking around and I'm trying to like, and I'm grabbing other Bibles and people are like, and, and the kids knew, they were like, hey, where's your Bible? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that specific Bible is really important to me because that was kind of, uh, is really my first Bible. And um, that's when I discovered the Bible. Uh, listen to me. Right now, our nation is going through some difficult moments, and you might even call it storm. Jesus talked about storms that come in life, and the storms always reveal the foundation that you're building your lives on, whether it is on rock, Jesus, the rock, the word of God, truth, or if it's on sand. And right now, we have very difficult moments, and the reason why is we need to get back as a nation to building our lives on the rock, Jesus Christ, and the word of God. That's just true. That's just true. We need the truth of God. Uh, Many of you, you've been watching the news. I was watching the news this last week. And you see all of the death, the hate, the violence. This is an opportunity for us as a church to lead. The way we lead is with love. Listen, you know what's in our culture right now? It's called fear. Hmm. But the Bible says perfect love drives out all fear. And whenever something like this happens, there's always a group of people that want me to make a statement. They're like, you need to say, like, black lives matter, or you need to say, police lives matter. And the tough thing about it is if you say one, somehow people think you're against the other. But as a church, we believe this. 
God's called us to make it look like heaven. God has called us to serve alongside each other, to love one another. And uh, for me, I have a lot of friends that are police officers. We have a lot of police officers in this church. I have a lot of friends that are African American. We have a lot of African Americans in this church. This week, we'll be serving together, kids, in Jesus' name. That makes a statement. We love one another in Jesus' name. That makes a statement. We serve this community in Jesus' name. That makes a statement. When Jesus said you want to make a statement, pick up a towel and wash the feet of your brothers and sisters. Wash the feet of a police officer. Wash the feet of somebody who's African American. Wash the feet of your neighbor. Love them in Jesus' name. It is through serving and through sacrifice that the gospel wins. As a church, we are not afraid. As a church, we love all people regardless of their racial background. We stand behind all people, whether civilians or police officers. Why? Because we are centered on truth, on Jesus Christ. And we're going to raise kids not filled with fear and hatred and violence. We will raise kids filled with the love of God, believing that God is for us and not against us. But we got to rediscover the Bible. This church, we've lost the Bible. They, listen, do you know what happened? King Josiah actually sends some people to go and clean out the temple. And it says here in 2 Kings 22, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found what? The book of the law in the Lord's temple. They lost the Bible. <laughs> Listen, when your pastor loses the Bible, you're in trouble. When the priests have lost the Bible, we're in trouble. If, you know, and they're like, where is it? Where could it be? How about we check the temple? <laughs> Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan and they read it. I remember being right around 12 years old, 13 years old, on my bed, opening up my Bible and beginning to read the scriptures for myself. And this is what I found. That book is a living book. That book, the words in that book are not just words, there's life in them. I began to read, how can a young man keep his way pure but by living according to God's word? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We want to raise kids who know scripture better than they know the latest pop songs. But listen, they've got to see it in us. Is God calling you and your family to return back to the Bible? Is God calling you men as husbands and leaders in your home to return to the Bible? Is God calling our church, our leaders, our pastors, our elders, return to the Bible? Build on the truth of Scripture. When we do that, there's going to be storms, but this is what's going to happen. In those storms, we will not be shaken. In those storms, we will not be afraid. And what we'll see is this. We're going to see the power of God at work in our community, and God's going to lead us to take measures to clean house. Yeah. And that's our last thought. Yeah. You know, Wes, I was just thinking, um, Rachel and I, I'm not a news watcher, but we, we sit, I stayed up to about 1130 watching the news, just seeing what was going to happen, and I just was honestly thinking, this can't be happening, you know? I was just thinking, this can't be happening. And, and really what I started to realize is this, is I need to have more conversations because there's a lot of things I think I know that I don't know about what it's like to be a police officer, what it's like to be African-American in this nation. And so I thank God for friendships that I have with police officers. I thank God for friendships that I have with Ken Riley and, and people in our church that are able to help me because people will tell you, make a statement, you know, like you said, make a statement. I'm like, oh, I want to ask a question. You know what Jesus was really good at? Asking questions. I want to be like Jesus in that way. As we read truth and we see who Jesus is, we learn that he asked a lot of questions and he wanted to understand the pain and the hurt because that's where the gospel becomes good news, yeah. through our pain and through our hurt. The fourth thing wrote down that we see uh, that happens with Josiah is this, is God reorders your life from the inside out. So Josiah at 26 years old, Hilkiah finds the book of the law, brings it to Josiah, and he starts to read it. And he starts to read it. It starts to read him. And his life starts to change. Listen, when you start reading the Bible, you discover, my life needs to change. What would happen if a generation of students started to read the Bible and, and then we saw, saw our nation change? Our nation become like Jesus become like God, having his heart. This is what it says in 2 Kings 23. As he discovered it, 
It says, the, t- the king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of God. So he renews this covenant, and it says he pledged to obey the Lord. He confirmed all the terms of the covenant, and all the people pledged themselves to this covenant. So he makes this promise. He says, this, we're going to go after this. We're going to do this. We're going to follow after God. Well, now what? Well, then he starts to look around. He starts to say, we've gotten a really far, long way away from God. You ever once like started cleaning in your house and discovered my house is a lot dirtier than I thought? <laughs> you ever start cleaning and then it becomes spring cleaning? There's a difference, isn't there? Are you with me? <laughs> right. He starts to clean house and he discovers we've, got, we've let things go way too far. And so as you read in 2 Kings 23, here are some of the highlights of what he does. He removes Baal and Asherah from the temple. Baal and Asherah were gods that they worshipped. They were gods of sex and pleasure, and they were in the temple of God. So he cleans house. He removes them. He says, these are out of here. These are not part of our family anymore. These aren't here. Some of you have allowed pornography and allowed sex into your temple, into your home. And like Josiah, you need to say no more. We need to remove that. We need to get rid of that. As I read the scripture and I discover the covenant I have with the Lord, that needs to go in our family and in my life. Then it goes on to say this that he did. He he tore down the living quarters of the prostitutes in the temple. Just think about this. There were living quarters of the prostitutes in the temple of God. He tears them down. It ticks them off. He tears them down. He gets rid of them. He's like, I'm going to protect my family, so i got to get rid of this temptation. i got to get rid of this evil in this temple to protect our family. Some of you, you need to do some things and take some action to protect yourself or to protect your family. You need to change cell phone numbers. You need to delete some social media accounts. You might need to move into a new neighborhood. You may need to cut the Wi-Fi. You might need to delete cable to save your family. That's what Josiah does. It says he did away with the idolatrous priests. There were priests in there who were idolatrous. We need church leaders to come back to the heart of God, don't we? We need church leaders who worship God above all else. And then it says that he, he smashed the sacred pillars and the pagan shrines. These were Solomon's shrines. Solomon's idols from generations ago. He smashed them. Don't you love that word? He smashed them. He got rid of them. And then it says that he renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He renews the covenant of God. He cleans house. He cleans the temple. And I was just thinking, he got so mad, he started to, to, to clean the temple, clear it out. Is there somebody else who started to turn tables and drive people out of a temple? Jesus. Josiah and Jesus both cleaned house and wanted people to get back to the heart of God. And then it says this at the end of chapter 23. In our study on Josiah, it says that he issued this order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord, your God, as required in the book of the covenant. He returns them to one of the best, best moments of their story when God freed them from slavery, set them free, and led them towards the promised land. He said, we need to celebrate. And it says in scripture that, that there hadn't been a celebration like that since the judges and all the kings. He said, we need to celebrate. We need to return to God. He cleaned house. I wonder for you as you read the scriptures and you rediscover the scriptures, what is God saying to you this morning? Where do you need to clean house? What what have you let go on for too long? And you need to write your own action step this morning. You need to write your own thing saying, I've let this go on. We've done this for too long and it's time to change in our family. Because we want to raise up Josiah, and I believe that during this week, there's going to be an eight-year-old that's just like Josiah that's going to become a leader in this church and in this nation that's going to change the world. But they're looking to us. They're looking to you. They're looking to me to make an example, to clean house, and to take steps in leadership. So what is God calling you to do? Where is God calling you to change? I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to uh, close in a uh, a prayer. So, Wes, would you lead us in a prayer? Yeah, would everyone go ahead and stand? This is a really big week coming up. 
We have a lot of great kids that are going to be a part of this, a ton of great volunteers. Some of you, you're going to be working, but you're going to be praying. Uh, your work has also been a part of how you've been contributing uh, to help make stuff like this happen. You've invested so much. My heart is so full. I was up here last night just going, I just love this church. I love your heart. I love your, I love your passion for the mission. I love how, as a church, you've just always gotten behind what we're doing. And uh, I was sitting back in the middle section in the back last night. And we were went around this week, and we put uh, close to 8,000 door hangers on doors. Some of you got one of those, didn't you? <laughs> so um, I, was, I was next to a family, uh, Mark, when you were preaching, and Ken was preaching with you. I, I was just out there, and I was next to a family. They were new. Hmm. And they came because of that. And uh, they, were lot, like, they were listening the whole time so attentively. You could tell God was doing something in their heart. And it was interesting, when you said, perhaps there's an eight-year-old that will be coming to the kid's camp that's going to be raised up as a Josiah, I saw the mom turn to the grandma, and she said this, actually, he's nine. Wow. <laughs> Signed up their son to come to the kid's camp. Wow. God has designed moments for you to meet him. If you would like to, this could be that moment today where you return to God where you come to God. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, right where you're standing, you just tell God, that's me, God, I'm coming to you. Go ahead and tell him that. It's me. If you are feeling that God is calling you to return back to the Bible, to get back into the Bible, building life on truth, cleaning the house, right where you're standing, say to God, that's me. You're calling my family back to that. Father, we pray as your people. We return back to that moment where you led us out of the slavery of sin and into a promised land relationship with you. We remember the moment our sins were forgiven and we were set free. And we thank you for that. We give you all the praise. It's a miracle, but you've brought us alive in Christ. And right now, there's a number of your sons and daughters who are saying, I want to build my life on truth. I want to return back to the book. I want to start cleaning some house, and you're leading them to do this, and you're going to do the work with them and through them. There's a number of people who know today's a moment that you designed for them to meet you. So right now, may they sense your embrace as they repent of sins and turn from them and turn to you and live out the potential that you have for them. Jesus, we worship you. We lift your name up. You are Lord. You're the leader of this church. We sing to you in Christ's name. Amen.